You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Cyberspace, the new frontier. These are the voyages of the podcast First Contact. Its mission, to explore every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. To seek out new viewers and have new conversations. To boldly view what many have viewed before. Welcome to First Contact, the Star Trek The Next Generation intro casts, where two veteran fans of the show walk a innocent ingenue through the intricacies of the series set on board the Enterprise D. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This week we are talking about The Dauphin, which first aired the week of February 20th, 1989. It was directed by Rob Bowman and written by Scott Rubenstein and Leonard Laudenau. James, what happened in this episode? Wesley falls in love with a dolphin. Riker gets his trombone jammed in the warp reactor. I haven't watched the episode when I wrote this, so I'm just going from memory. That's rounds about right though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're taking these synopsis seriously, frankly. What actually happens in this episode is that the Enterprise is a transport vessel for the young leader of a world who has been raised away from her warring home planet and it's hoped that she will be able to unite them. But she's a hot girl that Wesley falls in love with and the Wesley Love Story episode is one we've all been hoping for. Alex, what did you think of this episode? I I was kind of uh, hoping for the the in depth synopsis because my attention wandered so much. I I have a vague outline of what happened, and that's about it. James, do, do you have any thoughts on it? I I have no memory of this episode. It's becoming a common theme that I can only remember the episodes which are either really popular or really rubbish. Everything in between is just a vague blur. So when I saw that this was a Wesley Falls in Love episode, I thought the worst. And I actually quite enjoyed it. Yeah, it's fine. I think that's as nice as I'm going to be about it. It it doesn't do anything horribly offensive. It tells a single story. It's alright, it's not groundbreaking but it isn't as horrible as it could have been because you know in the early days Wesley was quite painful here you know he's all right I'm quite happy to get behind him getting some love action I didn't know what to expect from the episode going in the title's not really a giveaway but what I did get beforehand was the little thumbnail that came up on the blu-ray uh and if I remember right, little thumbnail was something on the lines of Wesley standing with a young girl and I just put my head in my hands and went, oh, God. And it didn't greatly improve throughout the episode, I'll be honest. I I had fundamental problems with not just the obvious production elements like costumes, but just the the plot wasn't that interesting it isn't really that interesting they do try to set it up with a sort of mystery you know where Troy uses her superpowers to say they're not what they seem and you sort of think well it's none of your business but didn't you as soon as you heard that well I mean you've seen it before I know but as soon as I heard that I thought okay they're shapeshifters That's always where you go, though, isn't it? I mean, if anyone says anything to you, they say, oh, look at that squirrel. It's a shapeshifter. I mean, it's your first response to everything. And like a stopped clock, I'll be right twice. Once on the way up. (laughs) 
So we we have these two characters, these two very memorable guest characters. I'm not looking up their names right now. We have Anya and Salia. Anya is a sort of governess type figure. Salia is the the young princess, essentially, who's going to lead her world when she's never really lived. On on that point of of her age, Alex has already said it, and you've just said it there that she's young, but. The actress is actually ten years older than Will We, so I think I think Operation U Tree should take a look at this. You know they do kiss, so I think it's on dodgy ground there. I I probably wouldn't bring up the U Tree references when we're on a podcast called First Contact. So we have these supposedly mysterious characters, but it doesn't remain a mystery for very long. At the very least, not for the audience. When we see in their quarters, Anya has transformed into a really, really bad Ewok. Like, it looks like the sort of Ewok you would have found on a bonfire or something like that, or in a dodgy car boot sale. What a horrible, horrible costume. Well, I mean, here's the thing. In Return of the Jedi... Let's not forget that those Ewoks were going to eat Luke, Han and Chewie. So, you know, nice and furry and cuddly, but maybe that's closer to what they should be looking like. And then, not too much later after that, for no apparent reason, she's a friendly teenage girl. Just for one scene. Why, why is she that? That doesn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand. I think it's just to rub it in the face of the actress who's playing the teenage girl because she was originally up for the part of um, Celia. Oh. And she didn't get it. (laughs) So they just put that in just to rub it in her face and say, look at what you could have won. Oh, Machin Amic, you didn't get a guest role on Star Trek Next Generation. Well, you did. You You got a secondary supporting role. I imagine nobody will hire you, especially not to be in Twin Peaks. To go back a step a moment, I think fundamentally it starts off on a fairly dull note in that... How's the episode starting? They're ferrying one person, let's just say a diplomat for the sake of argument, from one place to another, as has happened so many times before. There's no interesting in is there, apart from, oh, what are they? They're shapeshifters. So when that's gone, all you're left with is Wesley fancies a girl. And in actual fact, that perhaps produces, well, for me, the only interesting parts of the episode. But they didn't revolve around Wesley. They revolved around the other characters telling Wesley what to do. It's almost like something out of a sitcom. You go to the various characters who don't know anything about anything and you ask their opinion on it. Uh, Because I've been thinking about this and it's quite strange. Let's take a look at the sort of the the relationships, the the makeup of our lead crew. We've got, what, seven, eight regulars? None of them are in a relationship. It's a family starship. There, there isn't a single nuclear family amongst that. There isn't a couple amongst that. Nobody is attached. So we've got all these single people and Wesley is going and asking for romance advice from them. I think you only need to look at some of the quotes that come out from them. Do not be fooled by her looks. Her body is just a shell. So that line was written by Jean, was it? <laughs> I mean, they did. They didn't have the section where Wesley went and asked Data for advice about women. He, would he have said, "Ah, you just have to wait until she gets infected by a virus that makes her drunk, and then she'll be up for anything." Then you extend your robo penis. <laughs> there's, there's the the other quote: "Glands erupting with hormones. It happens to all of us." <laughs> Yeah, Geordie likes to talk about erupting glands. I don't want to think about any of that cast's glands. I think that the moment on the bridge with Worf where he's asking advice, I mean, they are playing it full up comedy in that particular scene where Worf's talking about Klingon women throwing things at him. And what do the men do? They duck. 
that's excellent. I, I quite like that, but it does seem to make a total parody of the Klingons. I mean, you can't take Worf seriously now, I don't think, because the writers are realised, yeah, let's just make him a running gag. Of course, we can't forget how he originally attracted Celia with a superconducting magnet. Now, I don't know about you, but I usually carry around a superconducting magnet to attract the ladies, and it works 37% of the time. Is it not your magnetic personality? I'm pretty sure it's my superconducting magnet. Oh, yeah, you're you're probably right about that. Why is the magnet not in engineering? Does he keep the superconducting magnet in his quarters? Well, he's the superconducting magnet delivery boy, isn't he? <laughs> that is a, that that is what his job now is. And then just to establish yeah, she she might be compatible with Wesley. She's a geek too, because she knows what a magnet is. <laughs> is that deleted scene where they both go back to his quarters and play Dungeons and Dragons and some tabletop card games? Oh yeah. And go, going back to quotes on that bridge scene, I, Wesley's final quote here, I want to meet her, not dissect her. And... Is that what they call it these days? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what you get up to in the bedroom, but cut her open, have a poke around inside, then sew it back up again. That sounds perfectly normal to me. Uh, um, right. That's even more creepy than the thing Worf said. Talking of creepy, let's talk about the big set piece of the episode, which is Riker attempting to teach Wesley how to flirt what the hell? <laughs> and that was the bit I liked. I think it's a nice scene. You've got Jonathan Frakes playing himself, I'm pretty sure, trying to suggest Guinan. And they're going through this sort of horribly full flirty dialogue. I found it really cringy, to be honest. And, of course, th- this is... One of the first times we've noticed the Riker manoeuvre. Riker sitting on the chair by straddling it. It's funny uh, until, as you say, you sort of think through what's happening there. And and it, it does seem to sort of pass just being having a laugh. Shut up, kid. Yeah, that stuff is funny, but I don't know. I thought the actual flirty banter. I like, I like the way they ran with it because they're too... Actors that have good comic timing. You, you've got Riker flirting in the most cheesy way, but I don't know. There was there was a whiff of George Lucas trying to write a love scene about it. It's like someone who's never been involved in an actual chat up situation writing what they imagine cheesy people say. Maybe they do. I've not actually been involved in a chat up situation either. So I, I'm ju- I'm just going from other TV shows. I hate trombone music. It's coarse, it's rough, <laughs> and it gets everywhere. <laughs> I killed them. I killed them all. Oh, it's okay. It's only because I'm so in love with you. So yeah, you you, you like that scene then, Alex? W- would you fall for that? I thought it was funny. I, it's incredibly cheesy, you're right, and I can't imagine anyone ever falling for that. But... Yeah, it's it, it's that point where he going. This is this is funny. She told him to go away, and uh, oh, she actually seems to be quite turned on. Oh, oh, I don't want to know what happened afterwards. She tended his bar when Gene said he wanted to get more whoopee in the show. I didn't quite know that's what he meant. You might have made that joke already. <laughs> <laughs> Is Geordie blind? Where's Tasha? Puppies. We complained during the first season that engineering was a completely underutilised set. and It was a gorgeous set. And then Georgie got promoted and we thought, oh, we're going to see engineering more. And then he gets a new station on the bridge. But now we actually get to see engineering because apparently some some puppies have got burned and fused to dilithium crystals, I think. So they have to scrape them off. I think that's what's happening. So we get some scenes in engineering, but the whole thing is incredibly inconsequential. 
like you said, they're they're playing these scenes for laughs, but then they are trying to do a sort of genuine love story and also sort of a a story about a girl who doesn't want to face up to her responsibilities and and isn't sure what she wants from life. It's all sort of thrown in together in a, in a mishmash and. I think a lot of this episode feels like it's filler. Massive amounts of filler. When when they're in engineering, why does Geordie tell Wesley to use the ladder? It's uh, it's 24th century slang for uh, protection. That scene in, in engineering, because Wesley can't focus because he's met a girl. He's lovesick. He, he can't point the lasery thing at the wall and, and do whatever he's doing. And... I, and Jordy says, I see the way you're looking, but we've already established he sees a bunch of rainbows. Well, then Wesley says, I got something on my mind. I can see that. And you think, well, those uniforms are quite tight. That's the ladder he was on about. If you think how the show's progressed, though, I mean, injustice when we sort of had some slightly awkward teenage romance going on there when Wesley declares there are games he doesn't know how to play. We've come far. I mean, we, we have come far. I mean, for a start, this particular character isn't just wearing toilet paper. Progress. Making progress. And in fact, she's a giant representation of the concept art for Chewbacca. Yeah, she's sort of an abominable snowman, but she's also a shiny, webbly, wobbly thing. A light bulb. I mean, the last time I saw something like that, it was advertising sugar puffs. And you know what? I hated that less. I suppose we should talk about the date scene where Wesley goes to the quarters and she asks him how to use the food dispenser, if you know what I mean. And then Wesley lets her stick her fingers in his chocolate. How tough to use are these food dispensers? People always need to be told how to use them. You you just tell it what you want, and and then it gives it to you, like me. So so that happens. It's just horrible. I don't find it that horrible. I just think it's it's nothing. I nothing this episode. <laughs> Sorry, no, you you are right. It's it's not that it's horrible in the way because we have to be comparing to previous episodes. It's not horrible in that it's not racist. It's not sexist. It's not homophobic. It's just boring. They go on a date to the holodeck as well. I'm going to show you some poorly rendered graphics of of space. Take me to Russell 5. Russell 5. Russell 5 is a rock. What are Russell's 1 through 4? Taking a girl to the holodeck is basically the equivalent of me taking a girl home and showing a Metal Gear Solid on the PlayStation. It is a bit odd, really. Some some girls would like that. She's had a very sheltered life on the gas planet where she sat learning stuff for sixteen years. I mean, they have the they have moments where where you've got this comedy and you've got this romance plot, and then they're trying to create tension with the Anya character marching into sick bay and random crewman is ill, and so she decides to kill him. Right. You you cannot have anything against this scene. This scene is brilliant. Anya comes into sickbay and instantly attacks Pulaski. That is fantastic writing. That is Star Trek at its best. That is Pulaski's only scene in this entire episode. She instantly gets attacked. <laughs> From that comes... Uh, th- this slightly slightly weird relationship between Anya and Worf where she challenges him and then I- I get, and she's like, I am stronger. Ah, but you're going into the quarters. Is this flirting? Because at the end of the episode, and I think, again, padding, they have a special goodbye scene. And it's like, did they build up that significant a relationship? Uh, it, it It just seems like, yeah, we've got to do this. It's like the end of Lord of the Rings. Because then Wesley's like, oh, I I can't believe you're a shape-shifting chameleonic mutant. And she's like, oh, I didn't mean to hurt you. Goodbye. Let's not say goodbye like this. I hate you. Blah. Then you, she goes to the transporter and they're hanging around there for ages and then they have to come in again and, and Wesley gives her his special chocolate. 
it, it just it seems so incredibly drawn out for something that I don't think we managed to get invested in because they've only known each other for about 10 minutes. And then, even after she's gone, that's not the end. We have another scene with Guinan saying, uh, you'll, you'll never love like this again. There's not enough story to fill 43 minutes. I would have favoured an irritating B-plot. I, I am not joking, but when Wesley came in to give Salia the box of chocolates, I thought he was holding a superconducting magnet. It Go back and look. It looks like the superconducting magnet from earlier in the episode. I actually thought that is what he was giving her. And Riker gave a really odd nod when she changed into that oversized light bulb. <laughs> well, that's something. They uh, made a point earlier of having her say, my natural form is something you couldn't even begin to comprehend. Well, I mean, I don't know about the two of you, but I I can comprehend a sort of gassy, lighty thing in the shape of a human. Yeah, I, I, I can picture that. I can I can kind of understand that. Do you know what? I see it almost all the time when they go through the transporter. So how was the, the light bulb holding the chocolate? Doesn't have hands. How was the light bulb holding the chocolate? It sounds like we walked into some sort of David Lynch film. I'd have enjoyed that. Oh come on. It's not as bad as you're saying. It was it was it it happened, you know, and, and it was <laughs> It's on. not bad. It happened. There were some things, they they occurred, and at the end we went, well, we've definitely just watched that. That sums it up perfectly for me. We definitely just watched that, and we also thought some other things about it. Which we're going to say in quickfire. Quickfire. For anyone who doesn't know and isn't an expert on French, uh, a dauphin was the title given to the heir apparent of the throne of France from 1350 to 1791 and 1824 to 1830. I, I just know that. I didn't read it in Wikipedia. The word is French for dolphin, which is a reference to, to the depiction of the animal on the French coat of arms, okay? <laughs> If you look closely in Wesley's quarters, and I know I did to avoid the awkward, there's a shelf and on it you can see an old style original series era phaser and communicator. These are the words of Maurice Hurley. Again, we're dealing with a monster show, and we don't do well with monsters. The idea was good, but the execution didn't work. If we had more time, I think that the show would have been better. Yeah, because time was really the issue. Well, you know, he does make a fair point. At least he admits they didn't do it well. I used to get a lot of mileage out of this joke at Telak conventions. The first girl that Wesley fell in love with turned out to be a shapeshifter who turned into a hideous monster, you know, after he had exposed his soul to her, which happens a lot to me in my personal life, and I was glad Star Trek was able to capture that parallel. Did he really get a lot of mileage out of that, or were people just being polite? See, the problem was he, he didn't have a superconducting magnet with him. If he had that, People would have been captivated. <laughs> Wesley Crusher's superconductor magnet prop, slightly modified, appears again in the Voyager episode Prime Factors as the spatial trajector matrix. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so the planet's at war because half of it's all permanently in night and half of it's permanently in day. Does that mean the planet's not rotating? And, and, and if so, if one half of it is permanently in night, Surely no life could thrive on that side of the planet. Nothing would grow. Maybe they can, right? And they they all live in the dark and the light people all live in the light. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're getting back into Code of Honor territory there. But surely then there's like no crossover and so they shouldn't really be at war. And and I maybe I just I missed it at the end of the episode because I, I was losing the will to live. But... Was it ever explained how she was going to bring about the peace? Well, she is a gigantic light bulb, so maybe she's just going to light up the dark side. 
in the in the credits, Cindy Sorensen is credited as furry animal. I think the sexism on set is getting to ridiculous proportions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was another thing that we watched and then talked about. Next time, we will be talking about Contagion. But for now, farewell. Farewell. Fairly well. I've got a picture on my hard drive of John Terry mounting a dolphin. Thank you.